I'm Robert Pilling and today I'll be doing a talk on WebAssembly. So first a bit of background. I work for ScotLogic where we deal with things like financial software, uh, government work and general bespoke consulting. So I've dabbled in uh, trading systems uh, like web apps, banked by the cloud and uh, even done a, a few years of mobile development as well. Uh, in my spare time I tinker with compilers, uh, explore WebAssembly, and I run an internal Rust meetup uh, where we are currently mob programming our way through writing a trade matching web server. Um, this is great for knowledge sharing and discussion, uh, where which usually ends up going down Rust shapes, rabbit holes, um, and irons out some some creases in uh, in knowledge around the language. So on to my talk. First, I'll be giving a high-level overview of WebAssembly, and then we'll get into the meat of things. So we're going to write an interpreter for WebAssembly, and to do this, we'll have a quick look at compilers, cover the three main parts of our, our interpreter, uh, the stack, memory, and control flow. And by the end of the talk, I hope to have enough of an interpreter cobbled together that we can do a little bit of maths with it. So watch this space. Now, why WebAssembly? I get a lot of people saying that the browser is a pretty specific place to focus on, uh, but WebAssembly has applications elsewhere, so as you may have heard mentioned, uh, server-side compute um, lambdas or, or functions as a service, uh, we can use WebAssembly for that, um, which allows us to nicely encapsulate uh, our code. Um, and uh, we can also sandbox local code with it, so uh, you've probably heard of the supply chain attacks, uh, so things like node modules, if, if that was WebAssembly it would be uh, perhaps a little bit easier to sandbox or um, uh, what we have at the moment which is JavaScript in the browser um, so that's sandboxed untrusted code um, but it's difficult to make it go quickly uh, we, we need a lot of infrastructure for that uh, whereas WebAssembly makes this a little bit more trivial um, then we, we move on to things like uh, micro front, front ends in the web so at the moment if you want to have different apps in your uh, web program uh, these are all um, isolated from each other via things like web uh, iframes and they talk you know, using post message which uh, means all of the messages between these uh, different micro front ends need to be serialized and it, it can be quite slow so WebAssembly allows us to run different uh, apps all within the same process so it's, uh, it's a lot faster. Uh, and we can also target various different machine architectures with, with the same WebAssembly module as well, which is really nice. So for those of you who haven't used it yet, or maybe you have without realising, LLVM is one of the tools that powers this. Uh, it's a code generator, so we can generate WebAssembly for Rust, Swift, Objective-C and C++, uh, amongst other languages. Um, and that's, that's, what, uh, that's what allows us to uh, have this, uh, this such a, a wide range of input languages. So that's WebAssembly. Now we've covered that, so let's move on to compilers. Uh, WebAssembly works a lot like LLVM, so we can use it as an intermediate representation of our code. This is great, any of those uh, languages uh, can now run in a browser um, in a local sandbox or, or even say on a, on a Lambda function as a service. So we can build all of our code as, as WebAssembly and leave the nitty gritty details to the implementation. Browsers will then execute this or, or any WebAssembly host and we only need to ship a single binary. So this is great if a little confusing. Now. I've thrown around a lot of acronyms, it's, it's all well and good, but I find the best way to understand something is to write a, a, a bit of a crummy version of it. Uh, so I've done this with side-scrolling games, uh, HTTP downloaders, text editors and, uh, and a C compiler. Um, now if WebAssembly had been a thing back when I wrote my C compiler, I'd have probably not gone nearly as deep into writing things like uh, like the code generator that, that churns out the machine code. Um, WebAssembly allows us to avoid uh, register allocation, uh, stack frame layout and calling conventions to to an extent depending on the, the source language that we're, we're building from. So that's compilers in a, a, a pretty high level view of where WebAssembly comes in. Now speaking of writing compilers, uh, what's the simplest machine that we can write? Now, a lot of you will have probably written one at some point, uh, perhaps without even realising it. So, a regular expression can be thought of as a little machine all on its own. Uh, we move it between states by feeding it characters, and we can take a peek at that state um, when we're done. So, once we've fed it the last character, and uh, if it happens to be in the, the accept state, so here if it's in the rightmost one uh, for the D, uh, character, then we say that the regular expression has matched. Now, this is this is interesting. Um, we can do this, and yet the machine has no variables and no memory, um, which actually limits what it can do. So, 
what's the next step? How can we improve this? Now, while we can do a lot with regular expressions, believe me, um, we can't still perform seemingly simple tasks. Uh, so it's, it's impossible, for example, to write a regular expression to match balanced brackets um, because it has no notion of, of counting or, or remembering. So this brings me to a, an interview question that a lot of you might have stacked up against. Um, how can we tell if a string contains balanced brackets? Now, uh, here's the solution and the first bit of uh, live coding. Um, now, you might have stumbled across this or, or even written something similar yourself. Um, so we, we can use a stack. So here we have uh, two examples. This one, this first one contains balance brackets and the second one doesn't. Uh, we've got this open uh, parenthesis here and then an angle bracket. Um, and then I've just wrapped this in a, in a little uh, show function uh, which calls our, our interview question balanced, uh, which tells us whether the brackets are balanced or not. Now, this uh, function just has a stack, and then for each character, if it's an open bracket, then we push a closed bracket onto the stack, uh, similarly here. And then, uh, otherwise, we expect to pop off from the stack um, the most recent one that we that we saw. Uh, and if it's that, if that's not what we expected, then we return false. Otherwise, uh, we've got to the end of the string. If we've um, exhausted the stack, then uh, then that means that we've got some balanced brackets. So if I just run this, we'll notice the first example here is true and the second one is false, which is exactly what we expect. Um, so this is this is pretty useful. We've got a way to count now. Um, we can look at nested brackets, um, but actually we can do a lot more than that. Uh, we can now write parsers for a large amount of programming languages, in fact, uh, all just with using a stack. Um, now, surely a, a stack uh, it seems it seems easy. Is is it that easy to write? Maybe maybe we could have a look. Um, so let's take a look at this uh, stack.rs that we have here. Now for a stack, we need a way to um, create it. I suppose uh, we're going to need a way to push something onto the stack, pop, and I guess it would be useful if we knew how to tell if a stack is is empty as well. Um, and for this stack, we'll need some kind of backing storage. So let's let's just use a, a vector. Um, it's a pretty ubiquitous data type, and uh, we can have a go at implementing these functions. So, the new function we just want to return um, a stack, and we'll just uh, initialize the vector there. Uh, push. I suppose we want to take some kind of t, and then we'll just uh, we'll just forward that onto the vector. So we'll just say push that onto the end of the vector. Uh, pop is going to be kind of similar, except this time instead of taking a t, uh, we'll return a t. So again, we'll do a similar kind of thing, except instead of pushing, we'll just uh, pop from the vector. Now this gives us uh, an option, so uh, we'll just want to unwrap that and just assume that it will always succeed, just to make things a bit simpler down the line. Uh, finally, we've got uh, is empty. Um, for this, we'll just want to return a boolean, and again, we can almost cheat a little and just say if the vector's empty, then we're empty. Now I've got a test down here um, that just pushes and pops onto the stack. So we start out with a stack one, two, three. Uh, it shouldn't be empty. We push four, and then when we pop, uh, we should get the four back. Then we'll get the three, the two, the one, and then it's finally empty. So let's give that a little run. So we'll compile it first, and uh, we'll just compile it with tests to check that um, that all works. And once that's built. If we run it, we should see our tests all succeeding. So, great. This is us done, and uh, we've written a simple stack. Now, while stacks look simple, they're actually pretty magical, because they allow us to do one of the most exciting things in the world, maths. So, one of the early things we learned in school is that we can't answer this equation by saying 12 minus 5, and then we add 2 to that, and then we, we times the whole thing by 3. It uh, doesn't work like that. We've got to group the operations, which we can arrange in a little tree. It's a bit like this. Now, the tree helps us do things in order. We can perform a traversal uh, where we walk along the tree to calculate the result. Uh, and in fact, uh, we can just demonstrate a little executor uh, to do just this for us. So here, uh, I've just got some, some code, and we'll just ignore the, the top bit for now. And uh, we'll take a look at this bit. So we've got an operator, and that operator is, is a plus. And then what are we adding together? Well, we're adding together the result of this operator, which is minus a 12 and a 5. 
and then also this operator, which is a times and a 2 and a 3, which corresponds to our other part of the tree. Um, so if I uh, if we look at what we do with this code, uh, we just say dot eval on it. So um, how does that work? Well, uh, if we look up here, eval, uh, it will then uh, an operator will then have a left and a right hand side. So it'll eval both of those, and then depending on what operator we are, we'll maybe want to add or subtract or, or multiply. Uh, so we'll just do that uh, recursively. Um, but this can't go on forever. Uh, at some point we, we hit a leaf like the 12 here. Um, so I suppose we need some kind of value. And uh, to evaluate a value, well, it is just the value itself. So let's give that a run and see what, see what it prints out. So we get 13, which is actually the right answer, um, which is, is a relief. Cool. So what we have here is called a, an interpreter. So um, the Python code runs, and the Python code is what, what cranks through and, and calculates it. But we, we want to do a bit better than that. Uh, we don't want Python around to, to interpret our, our abstract syntax tree, which is what uh, this bit is called. Uh, let's instead uh, try to generate some code. So um, what we have here is pretty similar. Um, except there's there's a few crucial changes. This time, instead of printing something out, we just emit some code at the end. Um, our syntax tree is exactly the same. Um, now, this time, for a value, instead of actually returning it, we don't want to return anything. We want to actually emit some code. Um, so here, uh, we're just going to use the stack from earlier. So we'll just push whatever our value is onto the stack. And then an operator is going to behave uh, similarly. So we'll... Um, get the, the left hand side uh, to emit itself and then the right hand side to emit itself. Then we'll, uh, we'll pop from the stack into, let's just call these two variables, so we have an L and an, and an R. Um, so we'll pop into the R because the right hand side was the most recent thing that we uh, emitted. And then we'll pop the next one into the L which corresponds to the, to the left hand side. And then, as before, um, if it's a plus we do a plus, if it's a minus we do a minus and so on. And we'll push that result back onto the stack. So if we run this, we now don't actually get an answer. Um, we get what looks like a lot of gibberish um, to do with uh, pushing and popping onto the stack. So this is interesting. Um, we still need to compute our equation. Um, and I guess we need some kind of little machine language that helps us out with this. So here's how we might do that. So we'll, we'll have a machine. And uh, I suppose the first thing that we need in this machine is a stack. So let's just add that in. And we'll call it a, a stack of values, just because the, these generic values will just be what we'll, we'll deal with. Um, and then we'll let's create uh, one of these machines. So we'll just do that here, and we'll just initialize the stack to to an empty stack. Um, now we want some way of, of running some some code, so we'll just say uh, m dot run, and we'll we'll want to give it some code in here. Now, rather than typing out uh, this code by hand. I think we can probably use <coughs> the, the code gen from earlier. So um, let's just tweak this a little so it looks a bit more rusty. So um, we'll have some instructions. So for this uh, for this constant here, we'll perhaps say uh, instruction const, and then we'll just create a, an i32 with um, the, the value that we've got, like so. Um, then we'll want to do something similar for up here. So we'll get rid of those pots and we'll have that be implicit in, in how the instruction works. And uh, for the add, I suppose we'll want to say um, we've got a, a binary operator and this binary operator is an add instruction. Um, then we'll want to do something similar for the uh, times and the subtract. So we'll just update that, like so. Um, and then if we if we run this code gen, or if we, if we read from it, into here, we've now got our uh, Rust code with some uh, with some pretty simple operands uh, ready to go. Um, how do we get the result of this out? Well, we need to see what's at the at the bottom of the stack. So let's just print that for now. Uh, so we'll just say uh, pop from the stack. Cool. Okay. So we have this. Uh, we've got these instructions, but we we don't actually have any implementation in our run method up here. So let's just uh, pop something in here. So we'll say for for each instruction. What we want to do is uh, we'll, we'll effectively just switch on that instruction. So maybe we've got this uh, this const uh, instruction, uh, which we'll just use to push onto the stack. 
Um, or maybe we've got this, uh, this binary operation instruction, uh, in which case we'll want to go a little bit deeper and just uh, decide on which, which uh, like binary operation it is. So we've got either add, sub, or multiply. So we'll just pop those in here. Um, so for an add, we'll want to add some, some left-hand side to some right-hand side. And then similarly for the subtract and multiply. Um, so we'll just update those. And that will give us our result. So we'll just we'll just call that X. And I guess we want to push that onto the stack at the end, a little bit like this. Um, but where do we get those from? So similarly to before, uh, we want to pop the, the right hand side first and then the left. So let's do that. And uh, then I suppose the, there might be some other uh, binary operators, we'll just ignore them for now and, and pop in a, a panic, and same for other instructions as well. Cool, so this is our, our machine, uh, let's see if it compiles. Great, so we've now got a machine and the output is 13, fantastic. So what we've done here is we've taken our, our syntax tree that we originally had in that Python code, uh, we've generated some instructions for it and that we've now evaluated these in our uh, little Rust machine. So that's pretty cool, but what's the use of this? Like, wouldn't it be handy if we could change the numbers, for example, and make our machine a bit, a bit more like a CPU and uh, tack on some features? So let's just recap where we are. So we've covered a stack and generated some stack code using pushes and pops to evaluate an equation. Now, stacks are great, but we can only look at the top value. Uh, memory is a bit more powerful, so let's take a little look at that. So we want our machine to be able to access a big flat array of bytes of uh, memory. Um, so let's see what changes we need to make to our, our machine for that. I guess first of all, um, we want some memory actually within our machine and we'll just say it's a vector of, of bytes, that's uh, easy enough. And then we, we want to initialize that down here. So um, again, we can just say uh, create an array. We'll just go with 64k of memory and we'll just pop that into into a vector. Now, uh, let's have a look at this 12 here. Let's maybe make that uh, live in memory instead. So what we'll do is we'll need to have a, an address for it. So we'll just call it A and let's have it live at address, I don't know, 42. Why not? Um, so now what we we'll want to do is rather than having the 12 hard coded here, we we'll want to do a load from this address. So we'll need some kind of some kind of load instruction. Um, so our 12 is gone, so we'll need to initialize that as well. So let's have some kind of store on our machine. And um, we we want to, I guess, store this 12 as uh, as a, a value. So we'll just say it's still an i32, and um, we'll just pass that over to the to the store method of our machine. Um, cool, OK. So we now load in the 12 indirectly from memory. Um, we also want to, at the end of this, um, I suppose we want to have some way of storing the result. So let's have a store instruction. And this store instruction will take this this whole value here, which is calculated, and it will store it in a, at an address. So we've got the value first, um, which is this part, and we also need an address. So we'll have that as uh, address r, which we'll call our, our result. And let's just pop that in memory address 12, for instance. So that means uh, now rather than popping the stack, we just uh, load from that address. So we'll just say load from address r, and there's a, a little bit of Rust uh, casting going on. And that should give us our result. So we've changed our, our bytecode, I guess you could call it here. Uh, we now just need to implement these instructions, so load and store. So let's just come back up here. And uh, first of all, let's do a, a load. So if we're loading, I suppose we've got an address to load from which will just pop off the stack. And um, for this, we will then get our value. So we'll just say self.load from that address and uh, a little bit of a conversion there. And then we'll, we'll push that back onto our stack, like so. Um, now, a store is going to be pretty similar. Um, except this time, we're going to have two uh, operands instead of one. So first, we'll have the value. So we'll say let value equals that and then we'll get the address and then we want to say self.store and again we'll, we'll delegate to this store function uh, and we'll store to our particular address uh, this value 
So now we've just these two functions to implement. Um, so let's just go to there. And we'll do the, the load one first. So uh, this one is uh, perhaps a little bit simpler in implementation. We'll just take an address and we'll, we'll give back a value. Um, so there's a, a little bit of uh, rust. Um, a little bit of rust uh, wrangling that we need to do, um, just uh, that I'll, I'll explain shortly. So we need to decide with this memory uh, what it looks like. Um, so it's just an array of bytes, but we're dealing with 32-bit integers. So um, I suppose we're going to have a, a set of bytes and four of them in a 32-bit integer um, that we'll, we'll want to load from memory. So we'll just say self.memory at a particular address and address plus four. So we'll take a slice of uh, four bytes of that memory. And then this is where our, our try into uh, comes from above, which is where we're just asserting that this particular slice here is of size four, and so it will fit into this uh, array of four. Um, so that'll always succeed, so we can, we can just uh, effectively assert that at the end. Now, that's great, we've got our byte, so how do we convert that into a 32-bit integer? Uh, we'll just match what most modern machines do, and we'll say these bytes are a little ending. So what that's saying is if I have the value 123, that's actually stored in memory as 3, uh, 2, and then a 1. And there's, there's a few reasons for this. So if we have a pointer to the start of it and we truncate it, we actually just still get the 3, uh, which is kind of what we want in most cases. Um, anyway, so we'll create an i32 from the, those little endian bytes, and that gives us our value. Cool, so that's, uh, that's that done. Now our store function is going to be pretty similar. Um, so this time we're, we're mutating ourselves, obviously, and uh, we're going to want some, some value to store instead, and uh, we, we won't return anything. Um, so this time uh, we'll have our bytes and we'll get that from the value itself. So let's just do uh, uh, that here. So get the bytes from the value, and then we, we want to assign that into memory. So we've got this, uh, this slice of 4, and we'll just say uh, copy from our, our local slice of bytes here. Like so. Cool, so that's our, our store and our load, and we've made a few few decisions on things like uh, endianness of our, of our memory. So, moment of truth, let's see if this, this compiles. It compiles, and does it run? We get exactly the same answer. So, it may seem like we've done a lot of work there for, for no benefit, but what we've actually done is uh, added a whole new feature to our machine. Now, it actually turns out this is how languages like Java work. So I've got a little uh, Java program here that I've called eval, and uh, this program takes three inputs, uh, it times the two of them together and then adds the third one onto that. Now, if we uh, compile that, we get a little uh, eval.class file, and uh, we can actually dump the, the bytecode that, that Java has generated for us here. So if I say Java P eval, um, so this is the, the bytecode. Um, ignoring the first bit, you'll notice we've got our, our eval function, and we have some, some loads, multiplies, and then returns. And so what this is doing is exactly the same. It's a, a stack machine that it's pushing and popping from. So I think we've, we've made some good progress. Now, we are missing one major feature from our machine. Um, I guess Java has if statements and loops, uh, which we, we don't have yet. Now, how would we implement an if? So we can do some kind of a, a, a test, I guess we need, but then we need we need like a go-to, uh, which a lot of people tend to find morally offensive, I suppose. But there, there is a way around it. So what we could do is we could have some kind of uh, branch instruction, which will behave as like our test or check. And then we need to decide where to branch to. And uh, we could say there's two choices. Uh, we might either want to restart a series of instructions to do them again, or we might want to, to skip ahead and uh, just avoid doing a uh, collection of instructions. So that sort of uh, gives us two things, a loop and a block. So that'll look a little bit like this. Now, as any game developer would probably point out, you can do anything with enough if statements and while loops. Um, so this is great. We can now do, do anything. Now, our branch instruction here, um, this br underscore if, has an index in which block or loop we want to escape from. And then we either go to the, the start of a loop or the end if it's a block, uh, which is what the arrows demonstrate here. Now, I've also made up some, some call instructions here just for demonstration. 
uh, and you notice on the right we've got this this plain BR instruction, which which is a branch that will always be followed. So this is cool. Uh, why don't we have a go at implementing that in our machine? Um, so we'll get rid of uh, we'll get rid of these this uh, maths evaluation from before, and uh, what we're interested in this time is uh, adding up uh, all of the numbers between uh, one and one hundred. So that will uh, th here's our pseudo code. And um, that will look a little bit like this, so we'll just pop this into our into our run. Uh, just bounce some brackets, and then um, I'll talk you through it. So uh, we'll start with a t, t for total is zero, and then for for each number in one to a hundred, we'll just add that number to i. Now there's there's faster ways or, or better ways of doing this, but I think this is a good a good test of control flow. Um, so we need to decide where to store t, where to store i, and we'll have our, our limit variable. And as before, uh, we'll just initialize these two variables. So total will be 0, and i will be 1. Now, what we've got here is we now have this, this loop instruction, which then contains more instructions itself. Um, I'll just talk through that. So we've got the loop block, and then if we have a look here, we'll load i, we'll load t, and then we'll add them together. And then we'll want to store that, so we'll take the value and the address, t, and we'll store. So that's adding i to t. Uh, similarly below, we then take i, we load it, we then take 1, add it to i, and then we take i's address and we store it. Um, so we've added i to t, added 1 to i, so now we want to do a check. So let's load i again, and we'll load our limit plus 1, so we'll load 101. And we'll subtract these. So what's going on here is... Um, we're wanting to see if this subtraction comes to zero because our, our test is basically going to say is a register zero and if it's zero then um, then we'll not take the branch otherwise we will. So if we've taken away 101 from i and that's zero then that means i must be 101. So in that case um, we, we don't want to branch otherwise we'll say branch to a depth of zero and the zero just means that we're going to go to this outermost uh, loop here and continue the loop. So finally at the end I suppose we want to load our t and, uh, and see what our result is. So we've got our, our byte code here and we just need to implement a couple of these new instructions so let's have a look at that. Um, I suppose the first one that we'll want to implement is our, our branch if um, that's going to have uh, some depth. Now with this um, what we'll want to do is uh, look at a condition that's on the stack. So let's, let's just pop that off the stack first. And uh, we'll just say, if it's a boolean, so we'll just do a bit of an into to get that, then we need to return some kind of some kind of way of saying break at this depth. So let's, let's just uh, invent an, an enum for that, shall we? Uh, let's just go up here and we'll, we'll create that. So we've got our finish enum, and we can either finish code uh, normally with a done, or I suppose we can break um, at some some depth, which we'll just we'll just use a U32 for that. Um, cool. So we we've got that. Uh, I suppose we want our um, unconditional version of this. So we'll get rid of the if. We'll not pop the value, and we'll just say break at that depth. Cool. So those are our break instructions. Uh, next, we need our loop instructions. So let's pop that in here. So we'll say we've got a loop, and the loop contains some instructions. Now, how do we implement a loop? Oh, that's easy, we can just pop it inside a loop. So, what we want to do is we want to run these instructions, um, and then depending on how they finish affects how we finish. So, if they come to some kind of normal conclusion, then that's fine, we'll just uh, complete ourselves as well. So, we'll, we'll break, and this break will just get us out of this loop. Now, if they come to some kind of a break, then this is where things get a, a little bit more interesting. Um, I suppose if uh, if it's breaking and the depth is zero, then that means it is it is us. So um, we're sort of saying we want to we want to branch uh, back up to this loop. So we'll just we'll just say continue here. Um, other, um, but that's only if the depth is zero. So let's just uh, let's just inspect that. So if the depth is zero, then we'll continue. Otherwise, uh, the depth is greater than zero, so we'll want to propagate this break. So let's do that. And uh, when we propagate it, we'll just subtract one from the depth to make sure that it um, it sort of 
uh, nest properly. So if we're breaking out of here, then we'll subtract one, and that will take us up to referencing the next block. Cool. Okay. So I guess our our block instruction, like our loop, is going to be pretty similar. We we'll just uh, code that up. So we'll have a loop here. Um, only this time, uh, if we hit a done, then uh, there's no well, there's no loop, so there's nothing to break from. So a done will actually just do do nothing. Uh, let's just bring that back in. And uh, if we hit a break, then that means we want to finish executing the code that we're we're at if depth is zero. Um, otherwise, we we'll want to propagate it. So we can just say if the depth is greater than zero, then propagate the break. Cool. So let's see if that compiles. And uh, oh, we've got a few things here. So. Um, our, our actual function needs to return some, some finish, so we'll just uh, add that in. And uh, the normal way of finishing will be uh, just the normal done. So let's uh, give that a whirl. So when I run this now, what, we, what we're going back to is our code from before, where we're uh, count, counting all of the numbers between 1 and 100, and uh, that should sum to 50-50, which it does. Fantastic. So I'm pretty happy with our little machine that we have now. Uh, we can take some machine code and we can execute it. Now it's quite laborious writing all of this this machine code to run on our CPU though. Uh, we've done a few naughty examples here and I'm after running something a little bit larger um, but I, I don't want to have to mess around trying to uh, generate all of this, this byte code I guess you could call it. It'd be handy if someone uh, could do this for us. Now it just so happens that my uh, my machine that we have here is WebAssembly, and luckily for us, my colleague Colin wrote a WebAssembly compiler which can generate all of these little pushes, pops, consts, and, and so on for us. So just to clarify that, because it, it's a lot to uh, to take in, we've got a machine that can execute a bunch of instructions that we've made up. Uh, now we need a machine to actually generate those instructions in the first place, um, so that's the, the code generator. That gives us the WebAssembly that we feed into our machine and then eventually we get the output. So Colin's talk, what was that all about? Now if you've not seen it, I'd recommend it, it's on YouTube, and it's a, a good overview for how to put together a compiler. So Colin invented a language called Chasm, uh, shown here, and using that he coded a program which can generate an image of a, a Mandelbrot. Now, at the end of his talk, Colin demonstrated this code by running it in a browser, uh, which then displayed this, this Mandelbrot image. Um, today, we're going to take the place of the browser. Um, so, how did I go about this? Well, I went to uh, the website that Colin's made, and um, what I did was, uh, you can either interpret this Chasm code, or you can run it as a compiler. Um, so, I ran that part way through, and... Um, I then, um, so I ran that part way through and uh, I sort of paused it before it was about to execute it and I pinched all of the WebAssembly code from uh, uh, Colin's chasm that, w that had been generated. So this gave me this uh, this mandelbrot.wasm. So we'll just have a look at that. So uh, here's the file. Um, now that's uh, a binary format, so we, we can't actually see what's in it, but luckily there's, uh, there's a few tools that we can use uh, that will do that for us. So if I run this, uh, wasm to wap tool, that will give us the uh, WebAssembly in a text format, and it's, it's nicely indented so we can have a rough idea of what going on, what's going on, so there's, there's a few loops here and, and so on. So let's get that into our machine, uh, we'll just get rid of this bit to begin with. Um, now if we run the same thing, wasm to wat and we'll run it on, uh, on Mandelbrot, this is great, so we've, we've got it into our machine. Uh, the problem is we can't execute this. Uh, this this isn't Rust code, um, but we can tidy it up a little bit. So we'll just get rid of some of the things that we don't need, and then um, I guess we need to just convert this into into the bytecode that we had before. Now it's a, a line to line conversion, and it just so happens um, I've got a throwback to earlier. So talking of regular expressions, they might not be powerful, but they're really useful. And here I've got some uh, that can just convert all of this WebAssembly code into uh, Rust for us. So let's just give that a go. Do all the substitutions, and here we go. So we had before the WebAssembly, and now we've got it into Rust. So fantastic. That makes our lives uh, a lot easier. Um, I'll just sort out some, some brackets for this. Just check we've got everything right. Um, cool. Okay. 
so that's our WebAssembly code. Um, now, there's a few extra instructions here you, you might have spotted. Um, so first we've got a, a few extra operators. Um, we've got these uh, bin op, uh, this less than signed operator, and uh, a couple of others. So we'll just bring those in to our machine up here. Um, always wanted to say this, here's one I made earlier. So here are our binary operators. So we've got a divide and, and a less than. So we'll just uh, pop them in there. And then we've also got this new uh, unary operator. Um, now what this does is rather than the binary one which takes two, this just takes a single value and we've got a equal to zero and a, a truncation one. Um, so we'll just we'll just deal with that. So it's the same kind of story. We'll pop something off the stack, do something with it and then push the result back onto the stack. Um, if we go back down, you'll also notice there's all these, these locals uh, which we can get and set. Now um, that's how Colin implements these variables, so x and y. Uh, a local is kind of like a, a fixed bit of memory. So um, we we can just implement that similarly to uh, similarly to our memory up here. So um, again, we'll just bring that in, um, and we'll just treat the locals as a as a bit of a dictionary. So we'll we'll get the the indexed th local, and we'll push that onto the stack for a local get, and for a set, we'll just uh, insert that into our dictionary. So we need to create this dictionary. So let's just this here and we'll just use uh, let's use a hash map and it's an index uh, that maps onto a value so we'll just need to bring that in as well okay and I suppose we'll need to pass that around wherever we call run so we'll just say instructions and locals uh, like that and right at the end here as well so great, we've got our locals passed, passed around, we'll just create them up here. Um, and we we can just assume that Collins code will, will always initialize a local before using it, so we, we don't need to worry about any of that. Um, there's one uh, other instruction that we need to look at, and this is a store instruction, uh, actually a store 8, which is what Colin used for generating the, the bitmap. So we want to just take the, the bottom 8 bits of a value and store them. So uh, let's just implement that up here near our other store instruction. <clears throat> so similarly to the store, uh, this one also pops a value, pops an address, and then we, we take the bytes and then we'll just take the bottom byte, so the zeroth byte, and store that at that address. Cool. So those are the extra instructions now added. Um, there's one other thing though. We're generating a, a mandle block, but at the moment we've just been popping a single value from the stack. So how how can we view this? Well, um, the way that Colin's code works is it generates the, the Mandelbrot in memory. So it's uh, like a 100 by 100 image. So if we have some sort of a bitmap, I suppose we want to, we want to have like a, an image. Um, and we'll, we'll just say it's a 100 by 100 image. And then we need to populate this image um, from, the, from the memory that's in our machine. And then once we've done that, we'll just print it out. And, uh, and that should let's take a look at it. Um, so, how do we how do we do that? Well, we can just uh, go over all of the coordinates, and uh, for each uh, coordinate, uh, we'll get the uh, the ith byte of memory, and we'll just say, yep, the image at that coordinate is that byte. So this will take us uh, left to right, top to bottom over the image. So, let's see if that works. Now we've uh, oh, we've a few uh, imports missing. That I just need to, to add. So let's start one. Um, oh, we need to bring in our image and uh, pass a reference to our, our locals here as well. So there's our reference to our locals, and our image is in this uh, TTY bitmap uh, module that I've written. So we'll just bring that in and use the, the image from it. Okay, um, oh, there's some unused variable, but that doesn't matter. So this is great. When we run this, it should generate. Uh, Mandelbrot. Uh, now this is really the white knuckle ride because uh, it's quite a bit of code and we've no idea whether this will actually work correctly because I, I've just cobbled this together. Um, so here's the moment of truth. Hopefully it will give us a Mandelbrot image at the end. There, the, the uh, program's done. And what do we have here? Well, it's the same Mandelbrot image from Collins. Uh, rotated a little because uh, there's differences in uh, where the y-axis starts. Um, but 
there it is, Collins code actually running and uh, on our little machine. So I'm, uh, I'm really pleased with that, I'm glad that worked. Now, what's going on here? Uh, I guess you could say this is a, this is a chasm program running in, a, in an awful interpreter. Do not use this in production. Now the, the software for it is chasm code or, or web assembly. Uh, I, guess, I guess you can call it whichever you like, both is true. Uh, to quote Obi-Wan, it depends on your point of view. But it's pretty amazing. We've taken this WebAssembly thing and we've run it nowhere near a browser, just from just from something that we've knocked together in the past 30 minutes, and we've still got the same result. We can peek behind the scenes and, and decide actually how we want this WebAssembly code to run. So we can not only run WebAssembly code, but um, anything that that compiles to WebAssembly. So we can run C code, C++, Swift, or even perhaps Rust code as WebAssembly, then inside our Rust interpreter, which uh, I think is pretty cool. So to recap, we've managed to go all the way from having a simple stack up to running pretty arbitrary code on our little machine. And I think this is amazing. It really is turtles all the way down. And uh, this brings us to the end of my talk. So uh, thanks for watching. I've had a fantastic time. So yeah, this is the open QA. So if anyone's got any questions they want to ask, please do just pop them in the chat. Uh, we've got a few observations. One of them is Mandelbrot fractal exclamation <laughs> mark. I guess it's, it's my favorite fractal. I don't know about you. Yeah, yeah, mine too. Um, it would have been cool if I could have added uh, a bit of a zoom and just, just go into the, the Mandelbrot and uh, see if it's turtles all the way down there. I mean, it, it's got to stop eventually, right? I, I've heard that it doesn't, but, you know, I haven't got the computing power at my disposal. Same. No, not, especially not if you're running uh, that kind of interpreter that I wrote as well. <laughs> yeah. Another person said, amazing how much you managed to squeeze in in 42 minutes. Oh. It's like someone had a stopwatch, didn't they? <laughs> Yep. Yeah, I uh, I really had to trim some things down to uh, to get everything in, but I, I feel I kept it to uh, to the most important bits. Um, I was glad that I had the the templates at the end because I I think there was uh, a lot of it was repeated. Like I, I quite like that about WebAssembly. Once you can grasp the um, the main like instructions that you have, so stores, loads, and uh, and so on, you you can sort of tell what what everything's going to do, and it it, it like opens up. Uh, the rest of WebAssembly for you, really. Um, it's it's just very accessible language. Yeah, it's super simple. Have you done anything with other assembly languages before, then? Yeah, so I've uh, I've done a little bit of tinkering with uh, x86. So that's the uh, the yeah. assembly language that most of our our machines run on, um, unless you're on one of the new uh, M1 Macs or a, or a phone, of course, which is ARM. Um, so I, in my spare time, I, I've written a C compiler um, which targets those and. Uh, that's quite a bit more difficult than, than WebAssembly. There's no safety there. Um, so, you know, if, if you're writing C or anything like that, you get you get the whole jungle as well as the, yeah. the banana and the gorilla that's holding onto it. Um, so how does the instruction set actually compare? Because I know the WebAssembly instruction set quite well. I mean, I couldn't tell you all the instructions, but I know there are about 40 or 50, and they're all really quite simple. With x86, how does it compare? Is it... A larger instruction set are the are the instructions in some cases a little bit more complicated in terms of the operations they perform. Yeah, yeah. So I think that's uh, that's a good question, and there's a lot of uh, routes that we that we could talk about there. So um, when you asked about the the size of the instruction set, so for x86, there's it's something ridiculous like fifty thousand instructions, um, and this is including like. Um, yeah, all, all of the single instruction, multiple data, like um, super scale. Oh, yeah, SIMD massively multiplies. Yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. And then you've got a lot of built-in instructions that uh, that aren't really used anymore, but are just there for backwards compatibility. So running it in 16-bit mode, or uh, you've got things like uh, uh, so, like figuring out um, sign, so trigger trigonometric, trigonometric functions uh, that no one uses because they can actually be implemented faster in software. Uh, funnily oh, enough. Really? There are trig functions on the CPU. Yep. Yeah, exactly. And there's even, um, let me, if I remember rightly, it's either SHA-256 or um, I, I think there's several cryptographic instructions on the CPU as well. There was a bit of a, 
um, a conspiracy about that where um, the Linux kernel is going to use some of these and uh, some people are like, oh no, we, we can't use that. We, we don't know the source of randomness and we don't know if it's if it's cryptographically sound um, and so on. So yeah, the, the instruction set has really uh, swelled over the years and, and there's quite a lot of scope creep. Um, but if, if you if you take it back to its basics, like the original 86, uh, 8086 chip, um, it's yeah. you, you can draw a lot of parallels with WebAssembly. Um, you know, you've got the basic um, add and store, uh, in, uh, add, multiply, and so on, and then you've got your loads and stores, uh, your calls and returns and uh, whatnot. But I, I always um, get the feeling with WebAssembly, it's a lot safer and it's more structured. So uh, loops, uh, as you saw in the talk, um, yeah. it, it's already demarked where what exactly um, will be looped over, whereas in uh, in x86 it's just you just jump and it just so happens to make a loop. So and by jump, you effectively mean jump to a different memory address. Yeah, yeah, and that's very arbitrary uh, as whereas well. Whereas with WebAssembly, it's break to a particular stack depth, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, exactly that. Which you would think one would be more powerful than the than the other, but it turns out uh, they're both equally. Um, as powerful and an equivalent in the end, which I also find quite kind of interesting. True, but from a security perspective, break to a stack depth is inherently more secure, I guess, than jump yes. to a random memory address. Yeah, exactly. And uh, just as easy to generate code for. Cool. I think we're we're done with this session. What we're supposed to do is pop back to the hangout, which could just be us two talking about processes once again, but uh, if anyone wants to join us on the Hangout, uh, it's, uh, you know, anyone can just turn their camera on, turn their mic on and just say hi and talk about anything you like, really. So cheers for that, Rob. Much in, really enjoyed that and catch you in a second. Sounds good. Catch you then.